Morning, everybody. So, what I want to do today is kind of do, take a kind of big picture look at deep water. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus at developments first, and then then dig down deeper into subsurface. Um, so, kind of to to start off with, I'll kind of talk at the the high level stuff, and I hope and I anticipate it'll uh, it'll complement what's going to follow on from IPA, and then we'll look at some subsurface examples. But what I want to do is look at some of the kind of uh, trends and the, the threads around these kind of things. So, so you know, some government health warnings to start off with. Uh, when I talk about wrecks, and I'll talk a lot about wrecks, uh, what I mean and what I talk about generally is when they kind of exceed 15% costs or 15% over, overrun on schedule. But you'll see that there's a kind of continuous thread through this about wrecks. Most of the things are based on my views and what I've seen over the last 15 years since I first started working deep water in the Gulf of Mexico particularly. The other thing and the challenging thing about deep water particularly uh, and developments generally is as they become increasingly challenging there is no single one kind of thing, thing you put your finger on that's causing the, the wrecks and causing the failures and causing the over promising and under delivery. But if you kind of take all of the issues and look at them as there, that there comes to be an overlying thread of issues. So the thing I'll talk and I'll raise about is pace, understanding natural pace, deeply understanding and appreciating uncertainty, but what are the core uncertainties that will influence and impact uh, a development success? Uh, and then thirdly, you know, there is no silver bullet. Time and time again in this industry, and, and I think it's one of the biggest causes, people look for something that's going to enable you to cut corners and find a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. And then finally, you need to deeply understand the business drivers behind things. You know, time and time again, as you look at developments around the globe, uh, including the ones I was involved in in BP, if they're strategic projects, most strategic projects are wrecks. All right? So as a rule of thumb, I always used to say to people going into the industry and working in the industry, don't get involved in strategic projects unless you can be pretty sure they're not going to be a wreck and there's going to cause problems for you. And then the other one, the kind of corollary is that because deep water has got many, many challenges, and particularly in the subsurface as we go into more complex and challenging geology, most of those are also strategic projects. So as it kind of follows, most big deep water projects end up being wrecks because of that. So what I want to do is kind of take you through first, look first at the kind of uh, overall track record and some of the things about deep water developments, and then kind of, as I said, dig down deeper into, into the subsurface side of things, okay? But before we start, so I mean, it's kind of easy to kind of feel depressed about this and, and kind of get yourself down, but what the industry's done over the last 10 or 15 years is massively impressive. Uh, you know, we've got an astonishing track records of achievements and... And, and if we only promised and delivered what we promised, people would respect those achievements and really celebrate them. Um, from, a, from a subsurface perspective, they're mostly, fe you know, mostly driven by the tertiary delta fed systems. But if you kind of look at this progression from where we are, the, the step out into the western margins uh, by BP in the kind of uh, late mid-90s and things like that, right the way through to where we are in Brazil and the, the challenges of the South Atlantic, if you look at what's happened, and as an industry, we should really celebrate it. We have done phenomenally well. <coughs> However, and that's the issue, when you look at deep water, it is littered. It is littered with development wrecks. You know, we have this industry, as Dave referred to there, an industry track record of over-promising and under-delivery. And, of course, when you look at that, each time we're stepping into, typically inherently more, for, particularly for the bigger projects. Once we've got ourselves established into an, into an area, into a basin, into a play fairway, into a region, and we're kind of looking at the smaller projects that will develop further on down the line, actually our track record is pretty good. But it's the bigger strategic ones, the first ones into the basin that causes the problems. And time and time again, we overpromise and underdeliver. And, and there's a whole suite of, uh, of reasons why, whether it's you know, underestimating or poorly communicating uncertainty and risk. Whether it's really taking into account the implications of subsea, because as we go into deep water, yes, subsea becomes the norm, but there are some challenges associated with subsea. 
you know, one is we gross, you know, we've got to take a discount of recovery factors at the moment. We're not going to intervene, we're not going to have the surveillance we have in dry tree developments. So in most of these subsea developments, you know, we overestimate what our recovery factors are. We overestimate how the fields will perform because we don't take into account that we really can't do with the surveillance we get in other normal fields. Uh, they also have their technology challenges, you know, the Gulf of Mexico and Brazil, the imaging challenges associated with that and our expectations of that. The geology is often more complicated, partly because we can't see it, and so we're often under, if we can't see it, therefore it isn't there. More often than not, if we can't see it, it is there. We just should use our benchmarks better. And then all of the kind of engineering and drilling and completions and the infrastructure challenges that come associated with where you're working at. The other one is that many of, and particularly these deep water developments, whether you're in a BP or in a Tullow or whatever you're in, they, are, they become kind of strategic parts of the company. The things that the company declare they're going to do. And they consistently say they're going to do them faster, they're going to do them cheaper, and they're going to do them better. They forget to look what everybody else has done behind them. And we are not a great learning country, uh, in industry, and we are quite a conservative industry in many ways. So, you know, when you look at that and you think of the drive, and we look at then the drive for pace versus cost versus profile and safety, you'll see as I, as I kind of develop my story, pace is a big, big issue. We drive pace, and all the time because of that, we import risk into other parts of the development, which fundamentally lead to this under-delivery under and over-promising. And then there's the kind of final thing, which the explorers believe. If we find it, we can develop it. It's easy. So we'll find it. Give it over to those guys, they'll develop it. And actually, we'll find it and tell you it's this size. And then when they develop this smaller amount, it, it underwhelms the external world. So, you know, that's kind of some of the things and some of the threads in which I'm going to talk about. When I talk about wrecks, this is the way I reflect on them. And, and this is a plot of, uh, of schedule performance versus cost performance. All right, this is kind of work that IPA have done. IPA are brilliant at getting this. I hate to kind of set, set this up for the next talk. But they have a massive amount of knowledge and insight into how developments go. But here you can see, this is, these are the ones where people pretty much deliver what they promise. Most of these out here, whether they're driven by unrealistic targets, the orange ones, insufficient planning, front-end loading, or technology stretch, the grey ones, they're all what I would think of as wrecks. And most of those, when you look at the data, are deep water. And time and time again, they end up being strategic projects where they've under-promised, over-delivered, and therefore destroyed value. All right? They make money still. Many of these wrecks, most of these wrecks have made money. I mean, you know, uh, if you look at Thunder Horse in the Gulf of Mexico, it's made buckets of money for BP, but it's not made as much as it should have made. And that's consistently the message. If you look at Mahogany, you know, it's going to make buckets of money for Tullo, but it's not making as much as it should have made. And there are reasons and there are fundamental threads behind this as to why it's happening. Okay? Uh, some work, uh, this is some stuff that I talked about when I talked to the World Petroleum Congress in 2005, but it, it, the kind of messages and the, and the story behind it are pretty much consistent even for today. This is some work uh, we did in, in BP on, on looking at the root causes of the wrecks that we were having. And a lot of these were deep water driven. And, and the kind of red, the full red buttons are the ones which were the big drivers and the big causes behind our wrecks. And it goes back to the conversation I was just having. You know, a lot of it is it's setting inappropriate targets. It's about pace. It's about how we lead things and how, and how leadership set the, thing, set the targets and how they communicate this and drive the agenda. And, and, and also how the teams don't have the courage to go back and challenge backwards on some of the things that are being given to them as gifts by leadership. Contractor management is an issue, but that's almost a generic issue in developments anyway. And the other one is risk management technical definition is usually very much driven by the target setting. Because you get set inappropriate targets that drive the inappropriate pace, not the natural pace of the projects, what happens is you, you provide a substandard technical definition for the project to be built against, and therefore it almost inherently becomes a wreck. So this is very useful because it helped us drive the focus areas that, that we worked on in BP from 2005 onwards. 
Um, but but it's, it's an insight, and it's a part of this kind of consistent thread I was talking about. And then the other thing is to kind of look at this. This is a plot of kind of, uh, of doability, how easy these things are to do from an engineering perspective against productivity, the recovery, the recovery factors. And, and the thing you should always remember when we're talking about deep water particularly is that we're consistently playing in a tough part of the risk matrix. They're either, you know, challenged because of environmental conditions from the engineering perspective or the geology is complex and everything else like that that goes with it. And very often, the pair are going together. So we're not down here, and yet time and time again, we see targets, we see promises, we see commitments that are driven by a belief. It's almost like a sticking blinkers on your head, belief that everything can be calibrated against down here, where actually we're playing in a much, much tougher world. So it's really important that all of these issues, whether you're a manager or whether you're one of the team, you deeply understand the consequences of working up in this top part. And then, you know, this is the other side of it, is recognising that, you know, once you've, when you, this is access, appraise, select, define, execute, operate, once you get beyond selecting your concept and handing it over to be defined, you're in a kind of management of no change. You're in a place where everything should freeze. And yet, you know, this is the point where your maximum expenditure kicks off, but your, your understanding and your influence and your ability to influence the project drops off. And yet you've still got significant technical uncertainty at this point. And so it's understanding the uncertainties, how those uncertainties translate themselves into risk to delivery of the project, and making sure you can make informed decisions that give you the natural pace that enables you to create a great project. There is absolutely no reason, from a technical perspective and from a, a kind of a common sense perspective, why many of these development wrecks happened. There's, they shouldn't have happened. And that's the thing that we need to learn as an industry and not continue to do. Or as Dave says, I don't want my share prices for the shares I own in the industry to go down another 50%. We have to create a sense of credibility externally. Lots of words on this. But this is kind of just looking at some of the trends and some of the, uh, s some of the aspects and the observations in the industry. Uh, what the, thing, the thing that this tells you is that there is no simple systematic kind of cause behind these things. You know, the average time from first order discovery in deep water is about seven years. The time has systematically decreased over the last few years, and we're down from starting at about 12 to 7 today. The number of penetrations down to 3.75, it says there. Hey, this is great. So we are doing things fast and we're doing things with less penetration. And yet we still got as many, if not more, wrecks. It isn't the answer to drill less wells because it's cheaper and to drive things faster. Okay? The uncertainty, I mean, and uh, what we're finding, and I'm sure that the IPA comes uh, associated with bringing mid sized fields forward warrants additional time. So anything from mid to large size warrants more time and more appraisal, more front-end loading as compared to the small and, the, and the very much the ultra-large fields depending upon how you develop them. But there is no systematic trend. The key point, and I think the, bo the bottom one is there, is when you get into more subsalt or complex geology and the subsalts related to that, we consistently overestimate the discovered volumes or underestimate them. We don't get them right by greater than 40%. If, we're out, if they're less complicated, it's a much better track record. So we also consistently underestimate the impact of that more complex geology is going to have on the development. Uh, this is kind of data that, that pretty much confirms this. It's, it's, it's largely work done by people at IPA, but it kind of tells you that there isn't obviously a systematic trend. The one I like is this IRR versus MPV plot. And what it says that, yeah, the simple tiebacks hey, they have really quite nice rates of return, and, and whilst the MPV isn't that great, you're not out in here in the bigger stuff, which actually, given the scale, size and scale of these, you would expect to have better internal rates of return. And then consistently, when you look at this plot, which is discovered volumes against total penetrations, what you're looking at is, is the big deep water stuff and the subsalt complex geology are the ones that sit in the red and the yellow zones and the amber zones. But there isn't any systematic track record. What we find is the higher IRR are driven by places where you know the geology and, you are, you, and you're, you're well established in the basin. You're either tying back or you're extending yourself into a known basin. 
Uh, and it typically, when you're into complex and, and subsalt type geology, then you're in a place where consistently you've got higher uncertainty and you generate lower value. <coughs> so it's kind of borne out by the data when you look at it. But as I said before, there is no simple systematic trend. One of the things that I used to push really hard when I was in BP, and I still do with someone I talk to other companies, at the front end of projects, the most important thing is to understand the business drivers for the project. What are the priorities you're going to set your project against? Because it will condition everything you do from that point. And the, you know, the four basic business drivers, safety, always everybody puts safety first, absolutely. So I'll put safety to one side, because safety very often isn't one of the big fundamental issues in terms of why these are development wrecks. It's not a safety issue. But then it becomes value, profile. I promised to deliver a production profile, have I delivered it? Costs, the cost of the project, and then schedule, the pace you drive the project. And it's understanding the interplay of those four, particularly pace, uh, which will drive the tenor of the project and drive the success of the project. But it is absolutely critical that it's clear that where the priorities lie. Am I going to drive this by schedule? If so, what are the trade-offs in terms of cost and in terms of profile promise I'm going to have to make? Because consistently what we find is that, fine, we'll say schedule is most important, but we won't accept that we need to make trade-offs in the other because of it. And so we promise, assuming that everything's going to work perfectly. But if you're going to drive things by pace, you know you're probably going to underdefine the project. You know you're probably going to have to make some cost compromises, and so you consistently you need to promise and make your promise contingent on that, not make your promise assuming everything's working perfectly. So it's really important, I keep saying this, and time and time again, project people doing work at the front end don't get this. They don't really deeply understand the, the business drivers and the impact of priorities. And then they also don't understand the consequence of strategy. If you're a strategic project, as I said before, the chances are it's going to be a wreck because it's going to be driven by the wrong drivers. It's going to be driven by something to do with company strategy versus actually getting a great project. So, you know, you look at these, and I just pull these together just as an illustration. So it covers pretty much a whole gamut of different projects. You've got Shehalian, Western Margins up at the top. You've got Mahogany and, and Tullow's great. So don't take this to Chris and Tullow. Uh, what Tullow's done is a fantastic job. However, they overpromised and underdelivered, and therefore it, it loses credibility externally. But what they did in the time they did it was outstanding. And it's something to really celebrate. The problem is you don't celebrate it because they overpromised and underdelivered. <laughs> but the same is true for Holstein, the same is true for Atlantis, the same is true for Thunderhorse. Diana Hoover, ExxonMobil, hey, they're the great developers. They consistently deliver what they promise more than anybody else. Diana Hoover was their first one into deep water Gulf of Mexico. It was a crater. It cratered. Why? Because they underestimated the subsurface. And, and then finally into Shehalian. And we'll talk about these. I'll talk about the subsurface side of these in a few minutes. For, uh, but, but I want to go and just... This is just kind of the development side. And you can see what I put red there. There are the issues that contributed to those being wrecks. But time and time again, when you look at them, pace becomes one of the fundamental issues that drives the redness in the other areas. The Thunder Horse safety side wasn't a kind of... There were some issues associated with the development that actually potentially put the put safety at risk, but it did. It wasn't the consequence really of why that was a risk. Why that was a wreck. This is the fundamental driver, time and time again. Interesting. Uh, Exxon didn't really drive it too much by pace, but they really got their subsurface underestimated. They assumed everything was going to be much simpler. When you look at the kind of uh, root causes, almost or the main causes of these developments and their wrecks. Um, Diana Hoover, subsurface, Atlantis, subsurface, underestimating subsurface complexity, Holstein, mahogany, all of that. Gun you know, Tullo promised they would deliver 120,000 barrels a day. They struggled to get 80,000 barrels a day. Uh, but it was, a great, it was a great success in what they actually achieved from a technical perspective. Uh, and they could, if they've not been driven by the pace, all of these, all of these could have not been read in the subsurface. Equally, Atlantis in, in drilling and completions, 
and Thunder Horse from a facilities perspective. And of course, Thunder Horse is, you know, is the biggest pr production drilling quarters, PDQ in the industry. 30% bigger than anybody's ever, ever done before. Had so many number one technology challenges that you knew that you were going to have a significant risk in the infrastructure in the facilities and also in the drilling of these wells. But was it factored in adequately into the development? I would argue it probably wasn't. So it's useful. This is from a development perspective. But the key kind of message, the key thing is to remember, what are your big drivers, profile, safety, cost, and schedule? And time and time again, we drive things by an inappropriate understanding of what the pace of the project should be, and therefore we import risk into other aspects. By driving this inappropriately and not driving at its natural pace, it creates risk in there and inevitably almost leads to a wreck. So when I talk about natural pace, what do I mean? Well, it's, it's, it, it's, there is no simple silver bullet in here. There's no easy answer. It's deeply understanding the uncertainties and risks about the project, deeply understanding the technology challenges, and building from the bottoms up a schedule that enables that to be delivered. All right? And, and once you've got that, it's, it's that... And then you understand the external factors influencing it, whether it might be government influence or partners. But make sure that then they, people adequately articulate the pace-related risks that the project's related to, particularly if it's external factors pushing it. But natural pace is built up from deeply understanding and a deep experience of development. And then what should, how long should this take, given the uncertainties and risks? And time and time again, you see natural pace driven from the very top that says, we will deliver this in this amount of time. And as soon as you've done that, you're in problems, because it's not driven by a deep understanding of where the sources of uncertainty and risk lie. And this is some work, and you may find that, uh, that the next talk will talk about it as well. But when you look at kind of, this is the IPA data on mega projects, in deep water dominated mega projects, what you find, this is the pace story, is that there's a consistent over half of the mega projects were wrecked. 100% of them were because they were fast-tracked. They were driven at an appropriate pace. And this plot here is the schedule-accelerated impact, and these are the ones that were not schedule-accelerated. So you can see they were much more consistent delivery. People could rely on them. Okay? So the critical, you know, the critical thing is about great realistic execution planning, but far more important is getting the front end right and don't, try to take, don't cut corners with pace. And natural pace is, all in, is influenced by all of these factors. And so you've got to take that into consideration as you build that up and articulate how your project will be delivered. So, you know, this is one example. A fast-track development, inadequate time in appraise and select. The concept, therefore, wasn't fully selected when they entered define. All right? The original... Uh, the, the original plan six months for defined then took eight, 21 months because of that. The contractor selected backed out at the end. The result was a forecast 30% growth in the sanction costs, although the project schedule was held. So they drove things by schedule, achieving the schedule, and it cost a billion dollars more. So these are the kind of classic examples. This is a particular deep water development. This is a but it's a great development from a technological thing and from what was achieved by the industry. But it over-promised and under-delivered. So the key thing is that there are no simple, easy answers. You've got to look at all dimensions of the development before you move forward. You've got to understand the resource base, the developability, the markets, so that you can, and the external influence, so you can make an informed decision cognizant of uh, the, the risks and uncertainties, and drive things through natural pace. So what I want to do now is briefly kind of talk about the subsurface challenges. So, so given that, what does it mean from a subsurface perspective, and where are the fundamental issues in there? Well, you know, for me, this is what I say it's all about. If you get the subsurface description right in the first place, the foundations, you can build from that. But if you don't get this right, and you cut corners, you try and go for the silver bullet, oh gosh, the seismic image will give me everything I want, then you're in problems. So it's having that, understanding deeply the permeability architecture of the field, understanding compartmentalization. Time and time again, many of the subsurface risks relate to compartmentalization. And then really understand subsurface uncertainty and risk and how which of those are critical and inform the, 
delivery of the development. And then think life of field. So if you've made your discovery here, this is my little cartoon of discovery, if you're developing only this part, the pale green, remember you need to think how I'm going to bring the life of field perspective in here. Because time and time again in these deep water developments, particularly in subsea, you're constrained from day one. You can't do EOR if you don't put it in and factor it in from day one. You can't do water injection unless you massively costly retrofit it, unless you put it in from day one. So you need to think life of field and how am I going to get that 60% recovery factor that I could potentially get and what are the additional investments in addition so that I can deliver this is my final field. But the technology challenges are surveillance, imaging, many of these are HPHT so they're really tough to drill. We don't do enough front end loading, we don't do enough appraisal. We need more automation and recognising we're working at the boundary and if you do that then you can put the natural pace of the project together. And you deeply understand the sources of subsurface uncertainty and you stand back. So what impacts the resource rate and profile? Am I doing all of the work that's going to enable that, that'll create my depletion plan, that'll enable me to make an informed decision on progress through this as a development? And time and time again, you don't see the subsurface team standing back and thinking, right, these are my three main sources of subsurface uncertainty and risk. What are the things I have to focus on with respect to this particular development that's going to enable me to inform these and make a conscious decision on the way forward? The three examples I've kind of put in here, one's a, a sanction assumptions problem. This was a field, a deep water field, um, and, and this was the development plan at sanction. The geology and performance was assumed to be near, similar to nearby fields but they had an extended well test in the centre of the field and it was really successful, it gave them fantastic rate. And so they built the development on the assumption that that rate would be consistent. They got, they got romanced by rate here, okay? Romanced by rate and so they put together this base case development assuming that this, this great extended well test here that I'd done was going to be the basis for the rest of the field's performance. So what happened? So that was the pre-startup, this is what happened into production. And the reds are places where the underperformed by comparison with where they predicted. The yellows were as well. And only the greens were the places that performed well. Oh, and what the only green, real green, big green area is where the extended well test was. Because the extended well test was the best well in the field. But they assumed that every other well was going to perform like that. What they'd forgotten to do, they got so romanced by rate, they hadn't actually really looked at the architecture and the complexity of the subsurface and they just assumed everything was going to perform and the seismic was there the data was there to tell you that the reservoir was much more heterogeneous than that so what happened we had a wreck it's made money they haven't lost money but it's made money so this was about it was a fast track development there was enormous pressure on the subsurface team to kind of move forward they ignored the potential impact of being over optimistic about the extended well test and the geology was assumed to be similar and consistent and homogeneous and there was no heterogeneity or compartmentalisation. There was in buckets. And the project management had no experience of understanding the subsurface. And they didn't call on help. So there's some kind of messages in there. The second one is another one. This is from the Gulf of Mexico. Fantastic seismic. When you looked at it, it was brilliant. And the team, because it was again driven by pace, Seismic will give us all the answers, because it has. It was super salt. It was super salt. It's above salt, so it wasn't below salt. It was great seismic resolution. And so they assumed the seismic would give them all of the answers. They collected the data, but they actually missed some of the things, purely because they were driven by pace. Okay? So this was the, the structure of the field. This is the outline and the footprint of the field. And you can see these are deep water turbidite reservoirs. And you could quite easily correlate these very simply, but actually the architecture was much more complicated. And the, da the data was there to do it, but pace drove them. And so at startup, they'd assume they had a very simple structure, almost like a monoclinal structure, and that they could inject water down dip and it would beautifully sweep up dip. Now you and I will know, if you put any structure like this, you're gonna have geomechanical challenges at each of the points of flexion. And when you looked at the cores and the subsurface data in those wells, there was indications of that, but they were driven by pace, the seismic was great, I've got a silver bullet, let's move it forward. What happened, it was much, much more complicated, compartmentalised, the stratigraphic complexity was greater, and they really failed to deliver anything anywhere near what they promised. 
So pressure of fast track developments again. Competition to be first in the air. The company, there are about four or five developments going on at the same time. Underestimated subsurface complexity because they looked for size because they're silver bullet. They didn't do the integration. And then it was a very small subsurface team and it was driven by a strategic agenda in the company. Strategic projects make wrecks. The final one I wanted to use is, is again another deep water one in the Gulf of Mexico. This is subsalt. <coughs> And the team did a super job in appraising the field. You can see here, before startup, they had 17 appraisal wells. This is the structure. This is what it started at the point of discovery. And this is where it was at the point of there. And so what they assumed, they knew compartmentalization was going to be an issue. And yet, they also recognized that the image wasn't great. And yet, so they assumed they got it all right at this stage and there would be no further compartmentalization impacts on production. What happened is when they turned the field on, the rates were lower significantly per well. The profile wasn't delivered. It was a wreck. It made money, but it was a wreck. Now, what they should have done, and, and this was, I still kind of get befuddled by this one, is really knowing you've got this kind of structural complexity, you know that there's going to be something sub-seismic that's going to kind of impact things. And they didn't assume that. And so there was, there was a degree of compartmentalization and baffling within each of these kind of segments of the field that they identified that meant that they didn't get the rates they required. They didn't deliver that. Therefore, they had to drill more wells. Therefore, it cost them more money. So there's a profile issue and there's a cost issue. So here, fast track again. It was a fast track development. Again, competition underestimate a subsurface complexity. So they did a great job up front, and then they forgot to translate that into how they're going to manage this field. So the kind of key things from a subsurface side is to get your integrated subsurface description right. Make sure that informs the depletion plan. Make sure that you're proactively seeking subsurface and knowledge and doing your benchmarking. Ruthlessly drive integration. Continue static and dynamic collect data collection and continue integrating your subsurface description. Recognize if you're in a subsea development because you're not going to get as much surveillance because it's more difficult to intervene the wells, you will not get the recovery factors that you first predicted. Take 5% off at least, sometimes even more. It's all about uncertainty and risk, keep collecting data, understanding the regional framework as well as the geology getting the best image you possibly can, and then integrating all of it to give you your ISD. And focus on resource, rate, profile, and development scheme decision. So, taking all of that, what are the kind of keys to success? Well, it's, it's really, these are the things that time and time again, if the teams had done them right and done them well, it would have, caused, it would have led to a great success, in addition to making money. So it's clarity on business priorities, integration, learning and benchmarking, 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 learning what's gone on elsewhere and, and really doing it in an intelligent way. So if the Magnus Sandstone is the best turbidite reservoir in the world, don't make sure that every th your development is as good as the Magnus Sandstone because the chances are it won't be. You know, value, understand the value of information, really deeply understand uncertainty and how and where it informs risk. Recognise if you've got technology challenges, you will probably need to translate that into your delivery challenges for your project. And deeply create organisational capability. Get deeply experienced people in there to help the teams and to grow that capability. It's particularly challenging at the moment as more and more of us, older people, more seniors, are kind of leaving the industry. It's about informed decision making, natural pace, transparency, no surprises, wise investment and quality through choice. Of those... <coughs> the thing that consistently bothers me when I look at developments is about pace and the impact of inappropriate pace. So, you know, what do I think is going to be the focus for the future? What are the things that we need to worry about? Well, and, and hopefully we will, if we deliver, we will be able to be better. So enhance subsea reliability, particularly the kind of technology try. And, 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 and the other one is is making sure, as trying to do everything we can, that we've got a kind of dry tree approach to subsea. So we can get the surveillance and we can do the interventions. Now, the Norwegians are just developing something at the moment which looks really, really interesting. And you could actually take away the discount and the challenges of subsea as a consequence of that. 
Make sure you've got surveillance in there. Make sure that you understand the natural pace and rhythm of your project and build everything on that. There is no easy, easy fix or silver bullet. You have to do an integrated job. And you have to think life or feel. That's about behaviour as well. And an industry, let's hopefully, will turn it into an industry that delivers what it promises, promises what it delivers, and ups that share price by at least 50%. Thank you very much. Escaping, yeah. So, um, anybody got any time for a couple of questions? Uh, you, you got a mic? Oh. Uh, just wait for the microphone and please say who you are and who you're working for. It might give us a clue as to why you're asking the question. Yeah, Anastasis Kokinos from Sander Engineering. Uh, you mentioned the Norwegians are doing something at the end but didn't elaborate. Uh, for, and I'm not going to elaborate any further. If you... If you kind of look at I don't know whether it's Statoil that have been kind of fundamentally investing in it, but the Norwegians have, have, have developed a new piece of technology, and, uh, and they've kept it very quiet, because I actually tested it against some of the people I go to the industry and understand about the engineering side. Uh, but what it does, effectively, it, it creates almost like a dry tree environment on the sea floor, uh, and enables you, it seems, that's what they claim, uh, to, con to look at, dry t uh, at your subsea developments from a dry tree perspective, and you have to take you don't have to take all of those discounts associated with subsea. I don't know that much more detail about it. It is very new, and it's being developed in Norway at the moment. Please over there. Yeah, uh, that's Steve Pickering, Slumber Show. Um, so uh, my previous career, I was certainly involved in a train wreck, and that was at Crawford Field in the North Sea, which I think probably still has the record for recovery factor. Of about one percent. Um, and you looked at the wrong reservoir. That's what was wrong. Sorry, you looked at the wrong reservoir. Well, what <laughs> we did, we had a train wreck, which was because the management of the company ignored the geologist and the reservoir engineer. Um, so, to me, the key issue here is is actually the people capability, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if you had any comment on that because we have lots cool. of people who are getting lots of training in our industry. But what they lack is a thing called experience. Yeah, oh God, there are two or three dimensions of that. One is you look at all of the if you if you go in, and I'm sure if you go into BP, I can remember it was in those days. You look at how much training of this type management people get, leadership get, and actually, you know, they believe they know it all. Most of them, and I was part of those at times, um, but they do believe so they don't need that training. So there's there's a piece of of, of training and capability and developments. I remember a very senior vice president in BP today, came to me and said, Mike, how do I make, I'm a gatekeeper for this development, what decision do I make and how do I make it? Gosh, at least he actually had the courage to say he didn't know. So there's a kind of piece about developing capability and leadership, which is really, really important. And then, yes, you're absolutely right, there's, the, there's this issue of the, the exodus of deep experience and deep capability. And I think the companies that are smart are the ones who recognise that and actually see the people who are leaving the BPs and Shells, etc., and grab them, but don't grab them full-time, but grab them almost like coaches. And then make sure learning and development and the pursuit of, of technical excellence is a core part of your, people, of your company's agenda. And if it isn't, you're going to have these wrecks. But it's a, it is the big issue. It is the big issue. But leadership training is a big, big, important one. You know, too many of us believe we know everything. Yeah, well, one, more, one more question down here. from um, Mike Doherty with Impact Oil and Gas. Um, are the problems um, consistent throughout the industry? Are there some companies that stand out in deep water development? No, I think, I think when you're looking at the big strategic projects, they're pretty consistent. Uh, if I said one company stood out, obviously it would be Exxon. They consistently delivered pretty much what they promise. Um, and that's because they're often not driven by that strategic agenda. So I would say if there's any one company that stood out above all the others, it's Exxon. Um, and, uh, but but uh, the other one that I would, I would kind of laud and pat on the back is Total. They've done a pretty good job on some of their developments as well. So those are the two that you kind of look at. But it's Exxon, it's part of their fundamental genre. Uh, and they are, but the consequence is they become a very risk averse company. They're not the greatest explorers in the world. Okay, let's move.
move on. Will you? Thank, thank you, Mike.